Uh, good evening. I now call to order the March 11, 2024 regular board meeting of the East Penn School District Board of School Directors. You know, I'll please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Two hours. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Okay, uh, first item on the agenda, a request to address the board. I have one, uh, but before I call that person's name, I'd like to read the following statement. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with public comment, speakers should feel free to express their opinion, comment, or question, and understand that this is not an interactive engagement with the board or with the administration. Please direct your comments to the chair, be respectful, not engage in profane rhetoric, and be mindful that others, including students, may be listening. I request that you consider that protocol when making your comments. For the members of the audience, please also be respectful and refrain from speaking during the public comment period. With that, I will now announce the speaker and that person's topic. When you step up to the podium, again, state your name, and you will have three minutes within which to speak, and I will give you a 30-second warning uh, when your time is about to be up. Okay, our first requester, our, our only requester for tonight is Ms. Naomi Sharpless, and she's here to talk tonight about Corral Department funding. Hello, school board members. My name is Naomi Sharpless, and I'm a senior at Emmaus High School and a member of the Emmaus Coral Department. I've had many opportunities along with others in the Coral Department throughout my high school experience. I had the chance to go to district and regional chorus festivals this year and last year. When I was there, I got to embrace music, make friends, and become a better musician. When I went to region chorus last year, there were two members that made it along with me. This year, we had five people go. Our choral director, Ms. Wallace, has worked hard to help us with our music and grow as musicians. She has put together countless fundraisers for us to do, so we are able to go on trips with a lower cost. She works hard and is a very dedicated person. She has inspired me to continue singing, learning, and to take every opportunity given to you. People like her keep our program running smoothly. There are other schools that may not be able to participate in these choral festivals because of their funding. I feel very lucky to be in a district where I don't have to worry about if I have the money to be able to participate. Thank you so much for supporting the choral department. Well, thank you very much. Okay, next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes for the February 26, 2024 meeting. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, next, we have the district update. Dr. Campbell. Thank you. We're actually going to start off with some really awesome news this evening. Um, and I first want to say that I do appreciate our student who came out and shared her experiences with us. It's certainly um, something in which we're always interested to hear. Um, to start off, um, you might recall that at our last meeting, our student representatives from SGA shared an overview of the outstanding accomplishments of many of our winter athletic ath our, many of our winter athletic teams, including our winter track team, and we identified those students that had recently comp competed at the state track meet. And so tonight, we are very fortunate to have. Um, Mr. Kyle Moore, who is a senior at Emmaus High School, and I, we shared with you at the last meeting that he is the state champ in the long jump. And so I'm going to invite Kyle up this evening, and he is joined. We're really fortunate that his family is here. Um, I think we're recruiting his sister for some track and field events, I've heard. Um, but we also have Coach Reinhardt, our head She's actually our head cross country winter track club as well as spring track coach. And she is joined by Coach White, who is our jumps coach. So I'm going to invite Kyle and our coaching staff up, and they're going to give you some insight to Kyle's outstanding accomplishments.
Good evening. Um, thank you so much for having us here tonight, and thank you for everything you do for our athletes. Um, none of it goes unnoticed. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to speak about such a talented, humble, and quiet athlete standing here beside me. Um, Kyle's one of a kind. He, he's going to be one of those that come along once in a coaching career, and I'm just honored to be here tonight to just speak a little bit about what he's done. Um, let's go back to 2023, last spring where he, his long jump mark of 24 feet, 10.25 inches, that's correct, 24 feet, 10.25 inches, broke the Emmaus High School outdoor record, but it also broke the Lehigh Valley all-regional record previously held by NFL football player Johan Dotson. He also was the EPC champion in long jump and triple jump. He was the District 11 AAA long jump champion and runner-up in triple jump. But he went on to be the 2023 AAA PIAA state champion in long jump. And he is the only the third athlete in the history of Emmaus High School to ever be a state champ in track and field. Kyle's bro broke two outdoor Emmaus High School records last year. It didn't just end at long jump. He decided to join the 4x1 relay as well and be the anchor. And uh, it ended up that their team was second in the state as far as their time, but they ended up in the finals, medaling fourth in the state meet. So Kyle walked away with two state medals and was also named to be a member of the PIAA All-State Track and Field team. Again, very rare um, and an honor. Then we got around to this 2024 indoor track season and uh, Kyle decided to break the 55 meter dash, 60 meter dash, mm -hmm. 200 meter dash, triple jump and long jump indoor Emmaus High School records. Uh, yeah, I had to write them down because I didn't want to miss any. <laughs> um, Kyle broke numerous meet records in long jump, including Ocean Breeze Invitational in New York. And again, if, I don't know if you know anything about track and field, but that's a pretty big deal as well. And then we went to Penn State, um, and he was the indoor state meet champion, again, in long jump at Penn State University, which interestingly, he'll be heading to Penn State University to continue his academic and athletic career in track and field. Um, I also want to give a huge credit and shout out to his coach, Coach Melise White, um, who's dedicated so much time to Kyle. Um, Kyle came out for track and field his sophomore year. So again, he, he only competed in two seasons in order to achieve these marks. So again, we thank you for this time and it's an honor just to speak about him. Hold on, don't. Yeah, we have more. Um, but I wanted to point out for our board in the community, when we knew Kyle was coming, um, I'm a visual learner. And so this afternoon, we mapped out on the floor. There's two taped Xs. Um, one is, is right here in front of the mm -hmm. our, our dais here. And the other is, is back in the audience. So that's about 24 feet. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, and at first I thought we measured wrong. And, and I will, in full disclosure, I will say a few of us were kind of giving the long jump a shot this afternoon when we were doing it. And Kyle, I can't even imagine how you do what you do. Um, but again, we just wanted you to have that visual. And finally, before you leave, our board president and I have a small certificate that we wanted to give you as well. It's amazing. All right, continuing with my, my update for this evening. And again, thank you to Kyle and his family for 
um, being here for that presentation. Speaking of winter athletes, we're incredibly proud, obviously, of our winter track athletes, also very proud of our, um, our basketball players. Both the boys and the girls made it to um, the first round of PIAA state tournament Friday and Saturday. They gave it their best effort. Um, unfortunately, their season has ended, but again, it was, it was an incredible season for both teams. In wrestling, we have freshman Emilio Albanese, who is headed on to the state tourna the regional tournament and the state meet as well. And we also have quite a few swimmers who have qualified for states. So good luck to Sar Sophia Harmon, Veronica Kravoski, Gloria Cleese, Mabry Krauss, Georgia Magditch, Izzy Sparico, Anderson Borst, Logan Hartman, Garrett Longbonds, Reed Lovett, Joe Lyons, Griffin Messenlaner, Logan Triver, and Julian Vlemic. Again, all of those swimmers are headed to the state championship meet that's held the end of this week at Bucknell University. Congratulations also to, we had quite a few students from Emmaus High School who have advanced to, the, to this year's state history day competition. That competition will be held um, the third weekend of April at Sus the University of Scranton. And competing in several categories, we have Nathan Johnson, Reed Hoffman, Michaela Sames, Jonathan Ant John Anthony, Lily Hoffman, Brighton Yu, Gavin Germain, Ayan Shaw, William Zhang, and Colby Zhang. So good luck to them later the month of April as they head to States for History Day. We also had several students from LCTI who have qualified for the DECA State Career Development Leadership Conference, which is, um, it was held in February, and they have now um, qualified to continue on in April for the International Conference. So we're very proud of our Emmaus High School students who attend LCTI who qualified for that competition. Those students are Damian Art, Dominic Ruggieri, and Jacob Walter. Some other announcements that we remind our community of, uh, the LTRIC Spring 2024 Open House is held on April 10th from 5 to 7 p.m. You might recall at our last meeting, we had Mrs. Thompson from LTRIC who came and spoke about the great programs, many of which are available to our students at Emmaus High School. So that open house again is held on April 10th from 5 to 7. You may have noticed on the kiosk outside of Lower McCungie Middle School, that um, our Lower Mukunji Middle School What's So Cool About Manufacturing team is in the annual What's So Cool About Manufacturing contest and voting is open March 13th through 15th for all Lehigh and Northampton and Carbon County schools. So this is a call to the community. First, watch the amazing What's So Cool About Manufacturing video for Lower Mukunji Middle School. It can be found on their website. And then please take an opportunity to vote for Lower Mukunji Middle School and show our support for that, ama that amazing group of students. We'd also like to share that recently on the district, we've posted our summer camp list. And so these are a variety of camps and activities in the East Penn area not necessarily directly affiliated with the school district, but some great opportunities for students and families in the summer. That list is available on our district website. The East Penn School District is, um, uh, is recognizing outstanding graduates in the 2024 school year at Emmaus High School through our Grad Spotlight program. And so nominations are being accepted now through March 15th. That means the nominations for Grad Spotlight close this Friday. So if you know of a senior that you'd like to recognize or nominate for that honor, please do so on our district or school website. A few upcoming events that I want to bring to the community's attention. Later this week, Lower McCungie Middle School Theater is presenting The Wiz. That's being held March 14th through 16th. Um, tickets can be pre-ordered online, which certainly makes it a convenient um, Convenient for the community, great, promises to be a great show. If you're available later this week, please check out and support Lower McKenzie Theater with The Wiz. The following week, the high school's theater department will be presenting Cinderella. That's March 20th through the 24th. As a reminder, high school tickets can be purchased directly online. If you're a golden card holder in the community, you're available to join the matinee performance as well. Any local Lehigh Valley professionals who would consider joining us for our career exploration fair, that fantastic event is scheduled for March 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. here at Emmaus High School. We are still interested in any 
local professionals who might be, be willing to come spend an evening with us and really share your career, your pathway, how you got to where you are in your field with our students. This is an event that's sponsored by the Education Foundation and really is a tremendous asset to our kids. Finally, Emmaus High School Shave for the Brave is on. It's scheduled for April 26th at 5 p.m. at the high school track. Um, all proceeds benefit St. Baldrick's to help combat uh, pediatric cancer. I encourage you, if you've never been to the event, it is um, phenomenal and life-changing, and I encourage you to come out and see the support for St. Baldrick's. The goal this year is to raise $100,000. If you recall last time we had the event, which was about two years ago, I think we raised $400,000. And so certainly I have, no pro I have no doubt that we will meet that goal. And that's my report. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Mr. Jankowski. Uh, just one comment. I think <clears throat> I've made it a habit of saying this every year around this time, but um, about two weeks ago, I got to see the Iyer Middle School performance of Mean Girls Junior. Um, and, and, you know, every year it just seems the talent is better and better. Um, not to undercut the talent the year before, because those who are in high school now are, are fantastic. Um, but, but just the, the pure talent from our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders is unbelievable uh, and I only expect the whiz to be equally as fantastic and the pipeline of of students just presents very well for the high school for years to come um, so I just want to send out a big congratulations to all the IR students and good luck and break a leg to all the uh, LMMS students all right. all right thank you for that any additional comments okay thank you Next item on the agenda is about on the budget. Uh, tonight we're going to get a presentation on the long-range fiscal and capital plan. Uh, Dr. Campbell, would you like to introduce? Yes, this evening we are continuing in our series of presentations on the budget. Specifically tonight, Mr. Saul is going to walk us through the long-range fiscal and capital plan. A little bit of background. We've had an in-depth look at revenues, expenditures. Um, this is sort of the midpoint in the process where we have that long-term look at the financial um, trajectory of the school district. And then presentations from this point forward really begin to talk, begin to look at new priorities that are being proposed, which then takes us, um, before you know it, into April and early May, where we start looking at the proposed final, followed then by the final budget. So at this point, um, I'm kicking things over to Mr. Saul. Thank you very much. As Dr. Campbell said, this evening we'll be looking at the long-range uh, fiscal and capital plan. Um, rather than put together a PowerPoint slide for this evening, I'm, I just, I'm putting the, the plan up. I recognize in many cases that the numbers get very small, but I'm generally not going to focus on the numbers this evening as, some, as much as really an overview of the plan and sort of acquainting everybody with the plan or reacquainting if that's the, uh, the the, the case um, for some board members. Um, but again, sort of an overview to, to just become familiar with it. Um, for, for board members who've been around, it's probably been a while since you've looked at it. And I always feel like uh, just sort of digging back in and gaining an understanding is helpful. So I'm going to move into the plan uh, just a little bit. There's narratives, uh, which you can read at your leisure, that talk about the philosophy of um, the plan, the philosophy of budgeting, um, additional information regarding each section. What I wanted to do is um, touch on uh, this page where we just we talk about what's included in the plan in terms of uh, the numbers that you'll find. Um, we actually have the actual audited figures for the past five years. So as you'll recall, uh, we have five years of actual information. That, that uh, when it's displayed uh, in the charts, is then followed by um, estimates for the current year. So you'll see the current year budget and the, the current year estimates. Um, you'll see then the budgeted revenues and expenditures, which we reviewed at the uh, previous meetings, um, listed there for 24-25. And then finally, a series of um, four years that include um, projections based on assumptions, which we'll talk about this evening. So on page, um, 
I apologize, I can't see the page on here. Page four, uh, we have the, the summary, and really this is a summary of um, uh, all the general fund activity that's included in the plan. So the first basically half of the plan you see summarized here. The second half of the plan really focuses on um, the capital reserve fund and the um, facilities part of the, of the plan technology as well. I'd like to take a few minutes to just um, go through the sort of the layout of this summary because you know, the revenues and expenditures and much of the plan is laid out in the same way. If you look down the left side of the plan, you'll see you know, key things, including on line 12, the total revenues, on line 27, um, the total anticipated expenditures, and then on row 30, you see the uh, estimated or the surplus or deficit. And then uh, on row 40, you see the ending fund balance. And I think they're, you know, if you're looking at this in summary, they're really the key lines that you want to look at. Again, total revenues, total expenditures, you know, are we planning for a surplus or deficit? And then where are we going to be at the end of the year in terms of fund balance? If you look, um, oh, and then below that at the bottom, and it is cut off a little bit on the screen here, um, we have some additional metrics that are helpful in terms of evaluating our overall financial health of the district. Those include fund balance as a percentage of the expenditures, as well as um, fund balance in terms of a number of months of expenditures. Um, that number of months is um, important to continue to consider um, bond rating agencies and um, um, generally best practice is to have at least two months of um, uh, expenditures on hand. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, we have this metric that we look at. We also, we also have a se separate metric that pulls in additional balances that we have. And we'll talk about that shortly. Again, if you look across the top, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have five years of actual. So in rows B through F, you can see the, um, you know, extracted directly from our audited financial statements for the, the previous five years. In, row, in column G, you can see the um, budget that was developed last year at this time and approved in June of 2023. That's the budget for the current year. And then you can see in column H, um, updated estimates. Um, and actually, this is something you haven't seen yet. This is the one new thing in the plan, is we have made some preliminary estimates in terms of where we anticipate we'll end the year in terms of revenues and expenditures. Since this is new, I'd like to just touch on um, key areas where we're seeing maybe some variances from the areas that we budgeted. In the, um, in the revenues, under local revenues, there's really three key areas. Um, current earned income taxes, or those local taxes, are currently estimated to be about $357,000 more than budgeted. Interest earnings, we're actually um, estimating a million dollars over what we budgeted. Again, um, we, we've talked several times about the very good interest rates. We were conservative in terms of that interest rate number, so we're about a million dollars over. And then the final one is the IDEA revenue, and that's coming in about $130,000 above what we had planned. So overall, in the area of revenues, we're seeing about a positive variance of roughly um, local revenues of um, roughly $1.5 million. In the state revenue area, we're actually uh, sort of the opposite. Um, we're sort of coming in below where we had anticipated. Uh, three key areas there are tuition from courts. We're estimating we're gonna be $73,000 under. Um, pupil transportation, we talked about that a little bit uh, when we looked at the, the graphs uh, and the expenditure, sorry, the revenue um, overview. We're Estimating will be a roughly $625,000 under there. And Social Security and Retirement Reimbursement, roughly $60,000. So in total in that category, about $750,000 below where we were anticipating. Net um, revenues is about uh, three quarters of a million dollars better than we had budgeted. In terms of expenditures, again, there are just three key areas. Um, where we see uh, you know, significant differences from what we had uh, budgeted. Those are wages, where we're about um, $838,000 under. Benefits, about $882,000 under. And then charter and cyber school tuition, roughly 
sorry, $560,000 over what we had anticipated. So there we're seeing a positive variance of roughly 1.2 million. So you combine those, we're at a, a positive variance of just under $2 million. Um, you can see the effect of that if we look at row 29, the surplus or deficit. We had budgeted for a um, deficit of $2.1 million. You'll recall that that was related to the use of the ESSER funds. So, um, but we can see that that deficit has gone from a negative 2.1 million to a negative 1.7 million, again, because of the positive variances, both in revenues and expenditures. Again, that was on row 29. Okay, so again, I just wanted to sort of step aside and give that little overview of those um, um, estimated revenues and expenditures for the current year since we hadn't talked about that previously. You, you said 1.7 million, I, you mean 176,000? Sorry about that, yes, yeah. you're correct. Just, and a negative 176,000, yes, thank you. Hence the sort of, I, I saw some eyes like, Go sideways when I said that, so thank you for correcting Little me. Little difference. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so with that, we'll move on and, and again cover a, a, an overview of the plan. On the next page, uh, which is again, which again is the second page of the summary, um, you can see that in columns G and H, it is the 23-24 budget and estimate uh, um, repeated from the previous page, so you have that as sort of an anchor. And then you can see the 24-25 proposed budget. Again, we reviewed that in the previous two board meetings. And then finally, you can see um, the uh, projected, um, projected years for 25-26 through 28-29. And let's move then to the assumption so we can understand a little bit about how we've come up with those um, numbers in the uh, projections. Okay. Um, in most cases, you'll see that we used um, the, a, a, a seven-year average, actually. Um, the, the previous plans, or at least the last couple years, uh, we had five years. This year, um, we added um, the last two, or let me, we added columns I and J. Column I is um, the 22-23 actual to the 23-24 revised, or what we're anticipating for the end of the year. And then uh, column J is the 23-24 revised compared to the 24-25 budget. So again, pulling in our you know, what we're anticipating to occur. Um, we've calculated the average of those, and as I said, in many cases, we've applied the average in future years. There's a couple of places, though, um, where we've not done that, and I wanted to, uh, again, call attention to those. The first is interim real estate taxes. Um, there's a lot of volatility, so if you look across call, uh, row 13, you can see um, a lot of volatility there in terms of up and down um, while we come up with an average, I'm not sure how reliable that average may or may not be. Um, so essentially, by it applying a 0%, we're just saying that the amount for 24, 25 will carry forward into the future years, and there will, will not be any increase or decrease in the overall amount. The next one is earned income tax. Um, <laughs> you can see, actually, we used the average for the first year. But then what we did is backed off by a quarter of a percent in each year moving out, sort of anticipating that, it, that the economy will need to slow. And so it's just sort of accounting for um, as the economy slows down and potential um, salary and wage increases, income rates slow. Um, so we're still showing growth, but it's just a slowing of that growth in future years. Um, so we've applied a quarter percent uh, decrease in future years for that. In terms of interest income, um, we haven't uh, applied any increase. In fact, um, this will be given more consideration and potentially maybe some sort of step down like we've done with the earned income tax. Because again, I'm not sure that we're going to be in a 5% interest rate environment for the next four or five years. Um, so I think we you know, need to apply some sort of step down. 
uh, unfortunately, it needs it's likely going to be much more significant than a quarter of a percent because if you're at five percent and you go to four, um, that's not a quarter per, of a percent. So we, you know, we'll give some consideration to that uh, as we further develop the budget and and um, further develop the plan. The next one is uh, community college tuition. Again, you can see there was a, there's been a little movement there. Um, I think there's a, a slight decrease, but overall. Uh, you'll recall from last time when our community college representative came in and talked to us, they really do try to keep it, you know, sort of level funding for the school districts. And so we just maintained that as a 0% increase. And the final one is um, transportation costs. There's a, I think there's a six, a little over a 6% increase on average. Um, what we did is actually applied 4%, which is the annual contract uh, increase. Um, based on the contract that's on the agenda this evening. Um, in fact, if it were, I mean, that was the out years in most contracts that were presented to the school district. So we've applied the 4% rather than the 6%. Those are really the, um, the five areas where we deviated from looking at the average. Um, you know, over the years, as I said earlier, we've added more years to, to the averaging, which I think should give us a better um, a better picture, a more stable number to use looking into the future. There are some additional assumptions which are included both on the wages and benefits page, and I'll uh, call attention to those when we get to those pages. Moving on to um, sort of the revenues and the millage rate impact or the millage rate calculations, um, at the top of this, uh, this slide number nine, you can see the um, you know three years of historical, the 24, 25 proposed, and then five years, sorry, four years of projected. In terms of the Act One index, obviously the first four years um, are all known numbers. The the last four are actually the statewide Act One index used in those is a number that's published by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Independent Fiscal Office, who does a study on um, all of the components that go into the Act One Index and annu annually publishes their four-year projection. And that's probably the most reliable um, projections that we could use. And the, uh, the next row, row number eight, the adjusted Act One Index, that is, um, calculated based on the base index and the, the additional pieces that go into the adjustment for those future years. And then you can see, um, you know, this, this uh, sheet pulls in things like the, you know, use of exceptions, um, the calculation of the millage rate, et cetera. I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom starting at row 41. Um, actually, if you look at column E, starting at row 41, this is the exact um, real estate tax calculation that we reviewed during the um, revenue presentation. So that should look familiar. And again, it's the same calculation that's used by, uh, that's on the form that we complete to submit to the Pennsylvania Department of Education. The next page, page number 10, um, has some visual representations uh, and historic information related to uh, millage rate increases in the Act One Index. Uh, again, you'll recall that we saw this during the revenue presentation, as well as the averages. And then at the bottom, there's just a visual representation of what the actual um, millage rate has been for the past, um, I think it's 11 years. Moving on, the next two pages are detailed revenue information. Again, they're laid out very much like the summary in terms of you see you know, each of the individual areas on the left, and then you see the actual um, budgeted uh, and projected, sorry, budgeted and revised. On the next page, again, you see that budgeted and revised and then proposed and, and projected. Again, laid out, laid out the same, but just in a lot more detail, so you can see all the individual detail like we reviewed during the revenue presentation. The next set of pages from 18 to 25, um, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. The next page, moving into the expenditure section, the first section, the first part of this section is um, wages or salaries. 
on page um, 15, um, at the, in the, I guess it'd be the middle, middle bottom, um, you can see some of the assumptions that are applied to the wages. Um, as noted on the, on the slide, or is it not? Sorry, it's not noted on the slide that I see. Um, I want to make sure I get this right. The East Penn Education Association Teamsters and East Penn Education Support Professionals have contract wage increases that are presently um, based on the Act 1 index. So those are calculated based on the actual index and then the presumed indexes for the, the uh, f future years, um, those that we put in the um, plan from the uh, independent fiscal office. Um, so again, you can see the percentages that were applied moving forward. As, as in terms of the Act 93, that is based on the statewide Act 1 index capped at 4%. The next two slides is um, related to benefits. Again, on page um, 17, you can see the assumptions applied. Um, probably the, 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 the largest uh, two here in terms of overall cost are the uh, group insurances, which are the health insurances. Recall when we talked about the expenditures, um, you know, that the, the increase for this year is 5%, and the goal will be to, to budget 5% moving into the future. So that's why we've used 5% there. The other um, big one here is the retirement um, contribution to the retirement system. And uh, annually, the actuaries at the public school employees retirement system um, calculate what they believe the um, the employer contribution will be in future years. And so we've used the uh, actuarial calculations from the um, retirement system. OK, here we go. Now, the next um, several set of slides are um, include district-wide instructional expenses, non-instructional expenses, and debt service expenses. And I want to call attention to the fact that these um, are non-wage and benefit expenditures. So the wages and benefits were broken out in the, in the pages that we just looked at. The, all of these expenses are non-wage uh, and benefit expenditures. Um, so you can see down the left side all of the um, individual areas as defined by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. And again, laid out very much like the summary. I'll draw your attention to the bottom where we've broken out some specific information that's been requested in the past. Uh, that is a total of the special education expenses. So that would be a total of all those beginning with um, 12 or 1,200 numbers uh, up above. Um, also, we have the total for charter schools, which would include both cyber and brick and mortar charter schools. And then we have broken out individually the um, total cost for brick and mortar as well as um, cyber. You can see that historically, and again, you can see that, um, you know, projections for that looking into the future. I'm just going to move forward. Uh, again, you can look through the, um, you know, the, the expenditure detail. I want to move forward to page um, 23. Yeah, sorry. So on page 23, which is the, um, which is the, includes the 2500s through uh, 5900s, this is sort of the end of the um, expenditures. I wanted to draw attention to the bottom, but I see it's cut off on the screen here. Um, one of the one of the things that we talked about during the expenditure presentation is the fact that the um, K to eight option uh, number two realignment. Um, the the millage phase in plan is has been incorporated into this um, well into our budget and by default into the um, capital plan. At the bottom here, you can see again. I apologize, it's cut off, but you can see what the capital reserve contribution um, was budgeted to be. Then you can see what the amount is to be used from capital reserve. So recall at the expenditure presentation last uh, the last board meeting where we talked about using monies from the capital reserve fund, 
but we couldn't spend those monies directly from the fund because of the intended purpose was salaries and other things that we can't use those dollars for. And it was just a function of how the capital plan, um, the millage, the millage phase in plan was structured. Um, so we talked about the fact that we were just going to reduce the contribution to capital reserve and pay for those out of the general fund. That's what you see calculated here. So in 24-25, you can see that we we should be making a $4.6 million contribution to capital reserve. However, we're spending $2.3 million, and so our actual contribution will be $2.2 million. Is that, uh, by maybe head nod, is that making sense to everybody? Okay, good. Um, try not to overcomplicate it, but. Um, so that's one place where you can see it uh, incorporated. Um, you also, will also see it, and you can't see it now, but I'm going to add a breakout similar to this on the debt service page so you can see what the existing debt service is and what the future debt service is. And I'll add that for a future version of the plan. You would also see um, incorporation of the millage phase in when we look at the priorities because some of those things are related to the, um, the K-8 to option too. And finally, um, when we look at the capital projects plan in just a few minutes, we'll see where it has an impact there, and I'll call your attention to that. And this is the debt service page. Again, I'll add a breakout here so we can see the existing debt service and future debt service um, or proposed debt service. I think that'd be helpful to see. On the um, page 26, this is the costing out of priorities. Um, ordinarily, you would see the list of priorities in the plan. It's been redacted for now until we have an opportunity to actually present those to the board. So when we present the plan again, you'll be able to see all of the priorities broken out here. The next section is the capital projects plan. Um, the capital projects plan is, I'll remind you that it's a dynamic plan and changes from year to year. So if you pulled out last year's um, um, capital, uh, you know, capital plan, capital and fiscal plan and compared it side by side, you would notice that things get shuffled from year to year. Um, some things need to be prioritized over, over other items. Um, but overall, it's sort of a working document for the next 10 years of what the priorities are in terms of um, overall projects. I'll draw your attention to, um, you know, if you look here on this page and see items specifically related to IR and LMMS, you'll notice that they've been removed, the expense has been removed um, from the cost column. Now we have listed the expense in the description. We've maintained the descriptions and the, and the items so that you can um, sort of see what was proposed um, and so that it's available for review. But we didn't want to include that, uh, those expenses because presumably those expenses will be picked up during the uh, realignment project. I'm going to move on to page 33. This is a summary of the general fund, pardon me, This is a summary of the general fund um, and capital reserve fund. And um, we can see the interaction between, between the two. So we can actually see you know, when there's a contribution from the general fund to the capital reserve fund. We can see that coming out of the, the general fund and being deposited into the capital reserve fund. In addition, we can see other sources of um, income for the capital reserve fund, as well as those annual capital um, projects. So we actually pull the total cost directly from those annual capital projects and plug them in here. And this uh, becomes essential for looking at um, you know, how much we have in, in the balance, in the ending fund balance from year to year to ensure we'll be able to cover those um, anticipated projects as we move forward. Um, I would say in terms of long range planning, this is like the most important page in, in the document because it really allows us to know whether or not we're gonna be prepared financially for those um, sort of annual capital projects that, that come up. Um, and again, uh, because we've incorporated the uh, K to eight realignment option, you know that also helps us evaluate where we'll be. 
um, because, uh, as I said earlier, it does contemplate pulling money out of the capital, uh, capital reserve. The next section is the evaluation of the combined fund balance and capital reserve contribution targets. Um, in the beginning of the presentation, when we were on the summary page, I had talked about having two months of expenditures on hand. And there's an evaluation on that page of um, you know, looking at the fund balance expenditures. This actually refines that just a little bit more and combines our capital reserve fund balance as well as our general fund balance to see where we are um, overall in terms of that. So, you, so the, when you look at row 21, you'll see where we are in terms of another number of months of um, uh, reserves on hand. Um, and this is probably a better indicator because it's looking at our overall reserves, not just the general fund reserves. At the bottom, um, we were years ago, we were always trying to figure out like how much should we be contributing to capital reserve each year. So we came up with a, a uh, formulaic method of calculating that. Um, and again, this is, while it's a formula and it's a, it's a good guide, um, you know, each year needs to sort of be evaluated on its own. And I'll give you a good example. If we look at 2425 proposed, which is in row column I, and we go all the way to the bottom in row 38, you can see it, we're sort of at a $6 million deficit of funding the capital reserve fund. But remember, we just said we were taking money out, so we're not making the full contribution this year. So again, those additional factors need to be considered when looking at um, you know, the contribution from year to year. Again, I think it's a great guide. You, know, you can see in 25, 26 that we really will be close to where we should be in terms of funding the capital reserve. Um, and we start to depart uh, from that a little bit, only because we maintain a static contribution to capital reserve moving forward, something we'll consider from year to year. The next section is a scenario analysis or sensitivity analysis that looks, like, looks at a number of scenarios um, in terms of real estate tax rate increases. Um, it actually combines um, a number of scenarios for 24, 25 with a number of scenarios for the out year. And so you can actually look at these and see, okay, well, if we combine a, for instance, 0% tax increase for 24, 25 with a 0% um, tax increase into the future, where would that put us in five years? And so that's actually scenario 1A, and you can see that we would be $67 million in the hole. Um, so again, you can sort of look through all of these and see uh, matching up different scenarios, what the impact is, and there's some little you know charts to sort of see that visually. The next section is um, supplemental information. Um, there's a variety of items here at the end. Um, the first thing, um, which was there was a question about last time about um, you know what does the tax increase cost the average tax uh, average homeowner. Um, annually, we get information from the Lehigh County Assessment Office that allows us to calculate what the value of an average home is. You can see it highlighted in column J. It's $215,032. Um, and what would the impact of the increase be? Well, you can look in, you know, if you look in column B at a 5.95% at a increase, um, that would equate to $258 per year. Um, so this is a great, a great page. You, you know, if, if you know your, the value of your home is over the average and you have an idea where it is, you can find the closest number and, and sort of see what the impact uh, to you would be. And hopefully our community uh, members are using this as well to sort of see what the impact of, of our actions are. On the next screen, um, this is similar, uh, but this just shows what the overall tax bill would be for um, homes at the various rates. If we look at the average uh, home, for the current tax bill would be uh, 4300 dollars um, And then this applies the uh, the index that has been used throughout the the um, the plan. So again, you can see moving into the future what the total tax bill would be at that particular uh, value of a home. 
The next page is just a comparison of budget to estimated as well as a comparison of budgeted to the next year budget. So it's, it's year to year and um, it's, sorry, it's within the year budget to estimated and then year to year uh, on the other side. And then finally, um, we have uh, toward the end, uh, the long range technology plan where we're looking at our uh, technology life cycle of, of our technology equipment. Um, and so we added this last year and we're starting to take a close look at this and how we uh, are gonna be able to continue to sustain the technology within the district. Um, we actually will be coming back to talk a little bit more about this as we further develop the budget in terms of some of the more significant costs that appear with regard to technology. And then finally at the end there's a glossary. These are the same um, terms and descriptions that we saw in the previous um, presentations with regard to fund balance and revenues. I was told before I started that I had 30 minutes to do that and hopefully I I wasn't watching the clock, but hopefully I made it. <laughs> so that brings us to the end of the presentation. And I would be happy, uh, Mr. President, to answer any questions the board may have. OK, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Saul. I wasn't watching the clock, but time just flew by. Um, OK, again, thank you for the, for the detailed analysis. Obviously, we couldn't uh, go through every single number, but it was a very good overview. And the. Um, these spreadsheets are accessible online for those at home if they want to want to look at it uh, more closely. And I'd like to open up uh, uh, the floor to questions from the board. Anything? Well, okay, Ms. Bowman. I, I, it's not that important. I, I'm just curious on the when you were calculating the um, tax impact. So it's sorry, I don't know what page this is. Page 43. Um, what, why did you choose those three amounts, like the 6.2, which I guess is the act one this year, but the 5.95 and the one, like were they random or were they, were they like? A little bit of both. Okay. Um, I usually try to pick numbers um, and these will change as the plan develops. Um, so the top number obviously is the act one index. The middle number is the current um, increase that's, that's in the budget. And then the 1%, I always feel like 1% allows you to sort of interpret your mind. So uh, if as a board member you're saying, well, I want to be at a 4% increase, you know, it's one times four. So you could take that $43 and multiply it by four. So that's why 1% uh, was selected for the bottom number. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, I, I do think it's helpful to see this in terms of the dollars that um, people are going to pay in their tax bill versus just a percent, um, which is a bit abstract. Um, and, I, and I will wait for your other presentations about priorities, but I do worry about having several years in a row of we're budgeting for a pretty high percentage increase. So it's looking like over four years, we might be asking people to be paying a thousand more in taxes. Um, so that does uh, worry me quite a bit, but I, I will wait for for more since we're, we haven't gotten that far in the presentations. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Bowen, valid point. Uh, Dr. Whitney. Yeah, just uh, one question and then uh, I guess request. So question, uh, if you can answer, you know, looking at the charter school numbers, um, tuition numbers for charter schools are somewhat pessimistic, is that based solely on trend lines or is that based on, uh, because obviously there's some movement in the legislature or at least attempts to at meaningful charter reform. Are you pessimistic about that? <laughs> or are we just basing this on reality <laughs> or uh, do we think there's a chance that that reform might happen? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this is based on sort of today's reality and what we know. Um, I think the other reality is since 1999, when charter, cyber charters at least, were first introduced um, with Einstein Academy and Ridgeview. Um, there's been talk of charter reform and it's 2024 and that hasn't happened yet. I think it sounds like it might be getting closer, but unfortunately for me, it's one of those things that when it happens, I'll, I'll believe it actually happened. Yeah, 
Understood. Yeah, agreed. Uh, thank you. So I guess the request would be, um, you know, looking at the scenarios, it seems like uh, obviously there's a rather large gap between zero and 5.95, and 6.2 seems like a not meaningless but a much smaller gap. I think it would be really helpful uh, to see scenarios based on, say, 3%, 4%, something in the middle. Uh, so that we can have those numbers in front of us as we consider. And, and again, we're going to hear about district priorities and all of that, but um, I would like to see those numbers as well. Okay. Instead of doing the math in my own head, which is just estimating. Sure. So in terms of the scenarios, I actually appreciate the feedback um, because trying to decide what's most useful for everyone else um, is sometimes difficult. So like we can easily remove the 6.2% Act 1 index at this point because we're not there, maintain the 5.95 or whatever that number may be, and then maybe something in between the 1 and 5.95. I'm happy to That'd do that. That would be helpful, yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you for those questions. Additional comments? Mr. Smith. Yeah, uh, just because you asked um, if you're looking for some place between 1 and 5.95, I would suggest maybe another <clears throat> option with the cost of the priorities removed. So we did, if we did, went forward with none of the priorities, what would that look like? Because everything else is already committed, right? So that's our, that's our wiggle room. So uh, what's, what, without cutting um, programs and services for kids, what does that increase look like? And then we can work up from there. Similar to kind of how last year, I don't know if anybody recalls, I kind of put a price tag on each one of the little um, priorities. So it might make it easier to have that kind of a perspective going into it. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Additional comments or questions? Ms. Bowman. This is just, a, I've, I've mentioned this before. Um, I, on the board, we had the uh, pleasure of being able to look at this on our computers, but the people in the audience did not. And I'm just another request that if these presentations could be added to board docs before the meetings so that the people in the audience aren't trying to read tiny little numbers up on a screen, or they, at least they can look at them on a laptop if they have one with them, it would be great. We. Uh, as a habit, what we do is um, for these uh, presentations, which are leading up to board approval, um, we put them in, in board content when the agenda is released, so the board has an opportunity to review those first. Uh, however, when we get to the point where we will be taking action, uh, so at the second meeting in April and the June meeting, the, the con those things will be available to the public in advance. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Any additional comments? Okay. I actually have a, have a couple uh, questions. Um, if I go to, let me find it. It was where we talk about uh, the estimated versus budgeted for special ed and charter. Um, I think that was page, uh, page 19. Um, so we had budgeted a certain amount for special ed and charter, and, and, we're, and it looks like we're going to fall uh, above that for the year. Can, can you comment as to what, what may have contributed to that? Is it a, 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 the anticipated number of participants, or? It, it, yes, I probably can. I probably I can probably comment more on the the charter. Um, in terms of the charter, it's, it was twofold. Uh, as I've talked about in the past, there are two components that um, are, are part of the overall cost. One of those is the number of students. Um, that you may recall that the number is not increasing all that significantly. The second number is the um, tuition rate. And the tuition rate is based on the school district's budgeted expenses for each year. And so the, the, tuition, the tuition rate went up higher than we had anticipated for the current year. Um, and so I think the tuition rate actually had more of an impact than student enrollment for, for, um, for charter. In terms of the, the question regarding special education, I'll say one of the um, greater expenditure categories would be for students 
um, who's receiving their educational program outside of one of our school district programs in our buildings. As a reminder, we are still obligated to financially um, support such programs, and so we've seen an increase in some of those specialized program costs. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, it was, uh, we talked about the, uh, the change in the capital reserve. Uh, it looked like going from the 20, 324 year to the 2425 year, the capital reserve was going to decline by about six million dollars. So are we? Are we? So basically, we're, we're we're taking money out of that from from what we had accrued, or, or tried Co to save up over time. Correct. Okay. Um, I think were we looking at this? Yeah, that was page 34. I think. It was. Okay. Um, I think it's the combination of. Um, Yes, not making the full contribution and using funds as well as paying for the annual projects um, okay. for that year. Okay. All right. Yeah, those were just two, two points of clarification that I wanted to bring up. Um, anyway, uh, again, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I do want to, uh, you know, echo some of the comments of my, my peers. That, you know, it is sometimes easier to see these numbers with, in, with intermediate ranges just so that we don't have to do the math in our head uh, for that, uh, just so we get a better sense for where things land. Um, and, uh, and, and to Mr. Smith's point, you know, understanding what we have um, without the priorities and then incrementally adding, I think is gonna be important so that we can understand what the impact of these things are on, are on the budget and, and maybe uh, you know, help us better understand uh, what what has uh, you know what's incrementally important and, and what we think we you know we should prioritize with that. Okay. Sure. All right. Are there any more comments or questions from the board? Again, thank you for the analysis and, and look forward to the next presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Next item on the agenda is uh, personnel. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the personnel items? So moved. Okay. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Uh, seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Falegi. Aye. Ms. Ford. Aye. Mr. Jankowski. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Klotz. Aye. Mr. Smith. Aye. Dr. Whitney. Aye. Ms. Bowman. Aye. Dr. Levinson. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, Dr. Campbell, I believe you, you had some comments you'd like to make? Yes, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize two teachers um, who are retiring at the end of this year, um, including Mrs. O'Hara, who's been a math teacher with us um, for 19 years at Emmaus High School. Upon her retirement, she'll have a total of 25 years in education and again, and certainly we'll miss her um, strong leadership in our math department. And also Mr. Schreiner is retiring at the end of this school year. He's been a health well fitness teacher at Lower Mukunji Middle School for 26 years. And upon his retirement, he will have 32 years in education. In addition to um, his great work with our students at Lower Mukunji Middle School in his content area, he's also um, Cert, part of our driver's education program. And so he's, he's certainly had an impact on many of our student drivers throughout the years in the East Penn community. So we wish them both um, continued health and happiness as they embark on a new, a new journey at the end of this school year. Okay, thank you, Dr. Campbell. Okay, next item on the agenda is business operations. I'm going to take this in two pieces. Uh, I'd first like to get a motion on A through E together. So moved. Second. Okay, are there any comments or questions from the board? Um, Ms. Bowman? Um, just a question about the Student Activities Fund. I'm guessing we didn't, did we not have a fund for Shave for the Brave before? Or like, why are we, why are we doing this? Uh, just a, if I could just get a quick explanation. We did not have an account before, a fund before. So what can you can what happened before? <laughs> Sorry. I, I believe that the the monies were were funneled through a different fund. Okay. Like a, a different activity fund, um, which is not a, sort of the appropriate way to right. to handle that. And so they've requested to open a fund specifically for this. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. 
And it's my understanding this is a, a more proper way to to collect and administer funds. Right. Okay. Um, I guess before voting, I just wanted to acknowledge the uh, the contract we're going to go with with Cutstown Cutstown University for uh, uh, to bring in um, graduate assistants who are reading specialists. I think this is a great way to leverage uh, expertise for. Um, um, already licensed teachers uh, who can come in and make a contribution uh, for what appears to be a reasonable rate. Um, in, in addition to you know being a good uh, you know a good uh, district citizen, I suppose you could say, in, in helping train our teachers and and, and and getting them to where they they want to be in terms of their certifications. Uh, any other comments or questions, uh, Mr. Flay? Just to echo that. Um with these graduate assistants, do we know where we're going to be placing them? We've not yet in? made a final okay. determination, but we will, I mean, I will share that, um, you may have noticed this in the agreement, they will be, East Penn will be working with Kutztown to go through the interview process so that we can identify candidates who we feel are a good fit to be part of our teams and in our buildings. It will be, they will be at elementary school, so again, it's gonna be really looking at um, student data, need. Um, I see these individuals working closely with our instructional specialists at each elementary building, our interventionists at each elementary building. So we'll certainly come back to you with the, their locations. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Anything else? Okay. No further questions on A3. Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, I'd like to now get a motion on item F, award of bid for pupil transportation. So moved. Second. Okay, are there any comments or questions from the board? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Next item on the agenda is curriculum, uh, the educational conferences item A, but before I call for a motion, I'd just like to make note of one uh, change uh, for uh, Matthew Wyman. Uh, the cost of his attendance at the Tri-State Innovation and Leadership Summit is going to be $98.50. I may have a motion to approve educational conferences. So moved. Second. Okay, any comments or questions from the board? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine ayes. Okay, I'd like to take the second item on the curriculum, item B, to adopt the 24-25 East Bend School District student teacher calendar. Uh, to, to my knowledge, there have been no edits since the last reading. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Dr. Levin? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, item C under curriculum is to approve the 24-25 Emmaus High School Targeted Support and Improvement TSI Plan Resolution. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Ms. Bowman. Yeah, uh, just a couple quick comments. Um, I do want to just uh, thank the administration for bearing with the board on this. Um, I do think it's important to allow for public comment, even though we didn't get any on this. But that said, um, I, I am happy that we waited um, just to give people time to digest the information. Um, just one overall comment, or actually there's two. Um, I'm hoping in the future we can be more inclusive, especially when something is directly impacting um, kids with IEPs, if we can be more inclusive of those families when we're developing um, plans like this. Um, 
I, I think our, our previous board member would have been a great addition to the team of people who um, worked on this. Uh, so it, I don't mean her in specifically. I just only say that is like obvious. There's people that we we know and can reach out to. So um, I'm just hoping that in the future we get those voices represented as we're um, coming up with these plans because that was the, the the main weakness that I saw in the committee of people. That um, otherwise it was it was wonderful representation from students, educators, administrators, and um, and so forth. Um, and, and my other uh, just kind of overall comment, and I did say this last time, but I feel like we really need to help struggling students earlier in their educational careers. Um, when students are struggling in their math skills starting in elementary school, it sounds like um, they're getting all the way to high school without knowing math facts. I, I think trying to intervene at the high school time, we've already missed the train that, you know, they've probably already checked out. They've been struggling for years. And so I would hope that we can try to figure out, try to target this group of students earlier when they start struggling in elementary school, um, again, in middle school, so that um, there's fewer and fewer kids getting to high school that need us to slow math down in high school. I feel like we should be slowing it down for them much earlier in their school careers. So that's it. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bowman. Any other comments from the board? Just a question. Dr. Whitney. And not asking this to lock you into anything, but just to have a sense, uh, when do you anticipate that the board might receive uh, an update on how things are going with this plan? Or do you have a sense of that? The plan goes into effect officially next school year. Um, as part of our, I think about the fact that the time when we gave the board had some information regarding the work that all 10 of our school teams do in terms of analyzing data and reporting back on student progress. So certainly, um, I always think at least um, a marking period of uh, is, a, is a reasonable bl block of time for us to begin to implement some of the interventions that are identified here and to come back and give um, an update. Okay. Thank you. Thank you if, for that. if I could also, and, and Ms. Bowman, I, I appreciate that your, your, your comment was a reflection and guidance and not necessarily a direct question. And I just, um, I, I felt compelled to share that our administrative team and our building teams couldn't agree more with you in terms of, um, and, and hopefully through other work that we've brought forward, um, you realize that certainly an MTSS or a framework of support that that is focused on intervening and identifying um, skill needs or or concept needs as early as possible is absolutely the way in which we should and do approach education. And so our process is never about, ooh, we see, see a group of kids who are struggling. We'll just wait. We think they might get it next year. We'll just wait. We think they might get it next year. Um, I think the example that we gave, certainly in the area of math, we talk about fact fluency a lot. Um, I sit in data team meetings where I hear our elementary teachers, you know, talking about students struggling with fact fluency. And so um, you will hear in, in some of the, the budget work, like there, well, actually, you, you may have seen this in some of the um, information already, like we have included some additional funds to support curricular programs that include some resources to port, support our students in the area of math and those needs that have been identified really at all levels. Um, so again, and that's just to say that we agree with you in terms of regardless of whether or not a building is ever in a certain designation from, the, from a state um, level because of performance on a standardized assessment, regardless of that, we agree with you that it is about continuing to look at how our students are performing both based on quantitative measures, qualitative measures, and saying collectively what are the needs by level, by building, um, and putting supports in place to address those needs and not ever sitting back and waiting and kind of keeping fingers crossed. Um, so thank, right, thank you, you for allowing me to, to respond to that. Thank you for that. Other questions or comments? I'm just gonna mention that, that again, I thought the, the plan was, 
was comprehensive and and liked what we when we heard about the LMS plan uh, last year. Um, you know, we use it as an opportunity to not only help the students that were or the student group that was targeted that were the that that triggered the need for the TSI, but also looking for opportunities to make improvements across the board. Um, and again, you know, playing into some of the themes that Dr. Campbell just mentioned is you know it's an opportunity to try and and uh, you know go across the whole organization and figuring out ways to to do what we do better. Continuous improvement is is important. So and and I think this plan reflects that. If there are no further questions, uh, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Smith? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Ms. Mr. Falegi? Aye. Ms. Ford? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Klotz? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Nine aye. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, moving on to other educational entities, uh, we have a report uh, from Mr. Smith for LCTI. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. <coughs> The Joint Operating Committee of LCTI met on February 28th. During the monthly meeting, we learned about a visit by Judd Pittman, who is the director of the Bureau of CTE, Career Technical Education for PDE. He stopped by LCTI for, um, on his listening tour and met with several LCTI students to hear about what their experience at LCTI has been like. DECA competitions continue, and there are we have uh, eight LCTI students traveling to nationals. The Southern Regional Education Board, also known as SREB, visited LCTI on February 14th and 15th to review the Career Pathways program. They visited to monitor progress on six items that had been marked for improvement and 10 recommended actions during a previous consolidated program review in 2020. Finally, in uh, conjunction with the SREB review, one of this year's goals uh, centers, centers around building a system of continuous improvement. This initiative was broken down into five main areas. They are increasing stake, stakeholder engagement, organizational culture and achievement, operational excellence, safety and well-being, and the staff and student experience. LCTI is also working towards developing an educational foundation like we have here in East Penn. A name familiar to many of us here in East Penn, Paul Champagne, is leading that effort with Bob Bold, a former Parkland School Director. Be on the lookout for a new weekly newsletter titled Five for Fridays, covering five topics each week specific to LCTI. And finally, I had mentioned in an earlier report that, that, that this might be a possibility. Due to the recent snow days extending the school year, unfortunately, Camp, LC <coughs> Camp LCTI is canceled for this year. Mm. And that concludes my, my report. Right. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Are there any questions for Mr. Smith? <coughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Look forward to your report <coughs> next month. Um, moving on to announcements. Uh, we held an executive session this evening where we discussed matters of litigation and negotiations. Uh, our next regular board meeting is on Monday, March 25th, here in this room. Uh, with no further business uh, for this evening, I'd now like to get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Check. Get some fuel. <laughs> <laughs>